Okay, the kingdom concepts we continue to work through here. It's a complex concept and not a singular flat concept and things. Uh, when you think about the Jewish people and how they envisioned the kingdom concept, in the past, um, Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, says, you will be a kingdom of priests for me. And so Israel has this notion that the, the nation of Israel becomes almost a priesthood to the rest of humanity, that you will be a kingdom of priests for me and things. Uh, in the present, Luke brings up this thing, the kingdom of God is within you. And so this kind of presence of it already within you in Luke, and then turning to the future, the future reign of Christ in this lion laying down with the lamb and various aspects that are, are talking about the future kingdom and describing that in uh, various ways. So um, there's the already but not yet, and uh, this is Dave Matthewson. It's a real big concept that he pushes, and I think very well, uh, very well you need to consider this. I think this is a huge thing in understanding the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is near and yet it is coming and how to understand the, the tensions in scripture with this and, and its complexity. It's beautiful. Now, Dave says the already but not yet and that has to do with timing. The already is here now, the not yet is coming future. But I want to shift a little bit on it and just tweak that a little bit with the here and there aspect of the kingdom. The kingdom is here and the kingdom is there kind of aspect. The kingdom is here, and, and what I'm wanting to do is, when I was younger, I thought of the kingdom, that it's like uh, we float around in clouds, and uh, Dr. Matthewson develops this too. He says, I tell people, I'm not going to heaven out there, uh, that I'm not going to heaven out there, and he basically says, uh, heaven for me is down here. And he, he makes the comments that floating around clouds, strumming on uh, harps, how boring is that, you know? And so he basically has a very uh, earthly, a very earthly concept of the kingdom. And uh, I think uh, that's very well established in scripture, but it's something I think a lot of times as Christians, we always consider the kingdom is up in the clouds, out in heaven, somewhere else in the universe. And when I think the Bible describes the kingdom in its fullness, it's on the earth. And this tikkun olam, that the earth is renewed, and so I want to look at some of these passages then where, where the scripture talks about this, this future kingdom but, but shows the very here-ness of it, on the earth kind of thing. And so, for example, in Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah is the big one that talks about the future kingdom and things. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, he says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations, all nations, you get this Abrahamic thing going out to all nations, all nations will stream into it. Many peoples will come and say, quote, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. End quote. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. This is the future kingdom. You beat your swords into plowshares. Plowshares have to do with what? Do you plow the, do you plow the clouds? Do you plow some heavenly uh, farm up in heaven? No, you plow, you take your sword and you put it into a plowshare because you're going to plow the ground. And that's on earth. You're going to raise a garden and, and, and you're going to have crops and you're going to, you know, those types of things. And so what we're having, do you see what we're doing is re-engaging this kingdom concept is taking us back to the Garden of Eden. So Genesis chapter 2, human beings are put on earth in a garden to tend and care for the garden. And when the kingdom is described in the book of Isaiah, it's very earthy, it's very gardenish, if you will. And so much of the Bible, then, is this return to Eden. Much of the Bible is this, and this coming kingdom is this return to Eden. And um, so that's Matthew chapter 2, verses 
2 through 4. If you jump over and check out Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, it says, For unto us a child is born. As soon as I say that, you think of all the Christmas songs that are built off of this. And he will reign on David's throne, again, son of David, and over his kingdom, over David's throne and over his kingdom. And so you hear the kingdom talk here, the son of David kind of thing. Establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. And so the kingdom coming and this Davidic king ruling over and establishing righteousness and justice forever. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 7, 6, or 9, chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. And then chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 11, and let me just read this one in a little bit, maybe more extended way. Chapter 11, verses 6 and following. Um, you get this. The wolf will live with the lamb. So you've got animals. Now, again, is this us up in the clouds strumming our harps and up in heaven? No, this is talking about a wolf and a lamb. And you know they've re reintroduced the wolves out west now, and so they're multiplying. And so we're going to have plenty of wolves. Okay, The wolf and the, will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together with a little child, and a little child will lead them. Very interesting. So you've got a wolf, a lion, a child leading them. What does that, does that ring any bells for anybody? A lion with a child leading him. Does anybody remember the, the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis? Is some of the, what he's building off of there in the Narnia series is this concept of the kingdom mediated through things like this. The cow will feed with the bear and the, their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. The viper, the lion, the wolf, the bear, these are all animals of this earth and things. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Beautiful, beautiful imagery there. Talking about this earth and the renewing of it in these uh, kind of incredible ways. Isaiah chapter 11, beautiful, beautiful passages there. So the kingdom is here, and yet the kingdom is to come. So, kingdom, beautiful concept. Where is your hope? How do you... How do you envision that hope? Um, and just one thing, sorry for jumping over to 1 John, but it's just a beautiful passage. And he's saying, basically, those that have the hope of Christ's return, how do they respond? They purify themselves even as he is pure. So in other words, this expectation of Christ's coming is something that causes us to be more like Christ. We look, and I, I grew up in a home with a father who... Basically, I remember much of my life going to the window of his house, of our house, and basically saying, you know, every day, Jesus could come back today. And that transformed his life. He lived in light of that all his life, 74 years that he lived. He lived in light of the fact that Jesus could come back today. And that changed who he was. That purified his life and things. And I remember when he was going down with cancer, and I knew it was really toward the end, and we were taking care of him uh, at home. And he, he told me, he said, you know, all my life I've looked for Christ to come back. And uh, he said, really, I realize now that uh, I'm going to him. He's not coming to me. And that was just a few days before he passed. And he realized that he was going to be with Christ. So that hope, that transforming hope that, that purifies ourselves. And we know that when we see him, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is, and there will be this transformation that takes place, the coming kingdom. Okay, so there, my kingdom, Jesus says, is not of this world. And you said, wait a minute, Hildebrand, you're talking about you know, this thing being very worldly. He's saying, no, at that time, not of this world, okay? Not of the worldliness, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and those types of things, the lust of the flesh. No, his things is not of this world. It's, uh, it comes from the Father, and it's going to be on the earth, but it's not of the earth. 
kind of thing in John chapter 16. So there's a here-ness to the kingdom, and there's a there-ness thing. The kingdom is going to come. The book of Revelation describes the kingdom coming down, New Jerusalem coming down, and being the, the, uh, the Garden of Eden with the Tree of Life reappearing and things. And so you've got the kingdom coming, but then the kingdom is also being here. So it's here and it's there. It's here and it's there. It's already, but it's not yet. It's already, but it's not yet. It's here, but it's there. And so you get these tensions in this wonderfully complex, beautiful hope that Christ is with us, Emmanuel now, but we hope for his return and the establishment of his kingdom as the son of David to rule forever and ever in righteousness and justice, to take all the wrongs of this world and make them right, to fix this place so that it hums the way it should be, the lion laying down with the lamb, justice and righteousness ruling. Things are right for once in our lives. And so we hope for that. We hope for that, the kingdom to come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 